Right then, I'll begin and say good morning, everybody. Such a weird time for me to do any kind of gothic -y horror talk because it's daylight and the sun's trying to come through. I think this evening I might feel a bit more in my little hovel element. Um, Sam's already introduced me, Melody Blackmore. I am from the outskirts of Leeds, so I am a PhD researcher and um, associate lecturer at Leeds Beckett. Uh, on the Gothic. Today's chat, it's a bit of an overview of my research where I look at Gothic trauma and its role in the landscape in horror film. So I've selected one of my films, which seems to be the most watched, most popular, because um, I do different other films. If you've heard of like Triangle, uh, we've got Wakewood, The Other Side of the Door, um, Apostle. So very, I look at British films in terms of since 2010 and what that means for us in terms of a culture. Um, I do a disclaimer at all my talks, um, but I don't think you'll need it today. But just to say, um, this is horror. Uh, there, there will be a little clip, like a little trailer, um, but it does have themes of horror or monsters or caves. Um, so if you are squeamish, um, just have to let everybody know um, with all my talks that uh, yes it's it's of the slightly adult nature um, and I will get started then and welcome all. It, it, it's even taking a while to wake up. <laughs> so just an overview of the talk this morning then so I'll go through a little bit of the plot synopsis and then lead you to where I'm going with it in terms of a different interpretation of this film. Uh, the main topics that I'm briefly discussing are that of Gothic trauma, the landscape and how it's a transitional space, uh, the madness that comes through, uh, especially in terms of the maternal and this journey of the self um, through this, this landscape and then moving on to endings. I apologise, I'm also trying to guzzle my morning coffee, aka breakfast. You all sound like you've got a lovely breakfast going on, but this is this is it. So the synopsis, the idea and be quick overview, what it's you know meant to be is a group of friends they go on this cave expedition, but then it soon turns into a nightmare when they get trapped and are pursued by horrific creatures. Um, that's the the overview of this synopsis, but we're going somewhere completely different with this um, this morning. I'm going to see if I can get this trailer working so that you can all just get get in the vibe of the descent with me. And just okay. give me a smile. Do you know, are you sure we're going the right way? I've never been lost in my life. <laughs> oh, there's only one way out of this chamber, and that's down the pipe. I'm stuck! I can't breathe! Okay, Sarah, you have to calm down. I'm coming, I'm coming back, okay? Okay. <laughs> Okay, move! Now! Now! This is not good, guys. Can we get out of here? Which way? I don't know. Sarah, but she saw someone back So what? I don't think I saw someone. I saw someone! No, you heard something and you saw what you wanted to see. It's the dark. It plays tricks on people. Please! Is there anybody there? Hello? What was that? I told you I saw someone! 
I hope I've all suitably woke you up then. Yeah, are you ready? <laughs> are you all awake now? Like, oh, um, if you haven't seen the film, I definitely all recommend that you spend, you know, perhaps your Sunday evening watching it afterwards. It's a really, really good um, creature feature, as they call it. But we are going to, I call it excavating. Um, you know, I don't do anything like geology, but the way that I interpret film is where I'm taking you with me today. So we're going to excavate a little. So from the onset, that is people in a cave being chased by monsters. Um, but we're going somewhere different. But what if? What if what we see and interpret in the film is not real? What we see is a projection of a traumatized psych. Okay, so let me just lead, lead you a little and explain a bit. The film itself begins with um, the protagonist, Sarah. We've seen this, this car accident happen where she loses her husband and her daughter. And she awakes in the hospital. And as she awakes, she is hallucinating or dreaming of her daughter with a birthday cake, as you can see in the picture. Um, so it's, it's very likely that it's, it's this memory um, that we see. And she awakes in this hospital, but the hospital is a further hallucination. It is empty. It is deserted. There's nobody there. Uh, the corridor suddenly starts to black out. She runs down the corridor because this darkness is chasing her. And then the film begins, you know, where she um, moves on through that hospital. There's the expedition, uh, the friends and everything that goes on. So there's a question here of what if she never leaves? Often in terms of trauma, there can be this kind of trigger of, a, as, as the title suggests, the trigger of a descent into madness. So what we're seeing is the projection of her inner mind. So the expedition, this, this great vast cave landscape, her friends, the crawlers, um, which the, the monsters in them are all part of Sarah's troubled mind. So this hallucination, and I'll, I'll exp you'll get to see more in detail at the end how this hallucination of her trauma begins with a birthday cake and it ends with a birthday cake. So she ends up on this, this loop of an hallucination because she never quite gets to, to leave there. Take a guzzle and then we'll begin with gothic trauma. So I put tropes, trauma and the uncanny. So I thought we'll start with something really fun, really easy before we descend <laughs> even further which is to look at the gothic, the, the gothic elements in this film um, as part of this, this romance in the gothic series. Um, you know, you guys probably have loads more and I'd like to see them all in the chat because I do this with my students where it's like, what else can you find that's gothic -y, that's, you know, dark or um, part of, of that element um, of the gothic. So the setting itself uh, with the dark caves, um, you know, it's it, that, the gothic setting um, often is somewhere that is dark, it has recesses, it's got its labyrinthine type tunnels, it's somewhere that is offering isolation. We've got the heroines and victims in this. Um, this almost, I suppose, seems a little bit Radcliffian in terms of um, Anne Radcliffe would often write her heroines as beginning as victims and then they would become this, this heroine that has, has mastered that trauma. So the hunted becomes um, the killers, especially in terms of the two main characters in this, the caves, which is that of Sarah and Juno. Uh, that they are hunted, but they've actually become killers themselves in this. So we've got the hero victim uh, role. Uh, high emotions, obviously, within any, any horror. Um, and it is a very gothic element to me because it's got this sense of, reminds me of early gothic writing where they would give these high emotions of betrayal and panic and fear and shouting in order to try and convey that in the reader or in the viewer it's to get you oh, feeling a bit 
oh, they're panicking, like in the clip where you can see a screaming help. You know, you kind of think, well, I'd do that. I might do that. Would I panic if I was stuck in a cave that small? Would I start screaming for somebody to let me out? Very likely. Um, so it kind of conveys that as you watch it. Uh, the supernatural aspect in this would, would definitely be the, this primeval creature, the crawlers, uh, which, again, I will go into a different detail on what they can represent. Uh, we've got the suspense and mystery um, of this gothic element in there because there's an adventure being happened where you're being pursued by killers, but there's this tension as to can they even get out, can they find a way. And the past, always in, in many, whether it's a, a terror kind of movie, whether it's a ghost story, the past always comes back to, to bite somebody on the, the bottom. Um, <laughs> nearly swore at 10 a.m. on the morning, that's close. <laughs> The, the past comes back, um, and in this term, the, we've got both the accident, the car accident, and the best friend Juno's betrayal of having an affair. So the past is there in the present. So to just briefly overview this part, you know, this isn't, don't worry guys, this is not a lecture on the uncanny. I've done the uncanny for 15 years and I, I'm not going to subject you to it today. Um, <laughs> But the uncanny does play this part in terms of especially the, the creatures. Um, you know, as, as Freud mentioned, the uncanny is that class of the terrifying that leads us back to something that was long known to us, once very familiar. So we've got this, this creature, this crawler, um, as we can see from that, that little pic as well. They are very humanoid, okay, the primeval humanoid creatures. There's something very familiar about them because they're not a they're not a complete monster. They're not a, a giant octopus in the middle of something with different hybrid parts. Um, you know, they've not got snakes for hair, very like a mythology side. They've not got giant werewolf teeth and, and claws. They're not very monster type. They are very much reminders of ourselves, uh, perhaps in a primeval way. So they, they bring this uncanny feeling, even their eyes are human-like. So they give this sense of, oh, um, you know, with, with the sense of how they come across. And also in terms of the uncanny, they are, there's the hidden into the open aspect um, where we've got this dual part where not only are the monsters hidden at first, you cannot see them, even the, the viewers aren't aware at first that they're there, but also the way out is hidden because of this landscape, because it's so dark and claustrophobic that you cannot find the way out and you also cannot see the monsters in it. You know, this film would take on a whole different meaning if it was in a bright, big, brightly lit palace room uh, <laughs> where the monsters are just stood in the corner and you can see the way out there. Oh, look, it says exit. There's no, there's no fear there. There's no, oh, where's the way out? Um, so it's kind of bringing that, that hidden aspect to it as well. And gradually we start to see them and gradually we start to see the way out as well. So it, it gives the shudders that way. And moving on through, this is a really lovely way to think about how film itself, or art, um, or literature, um, you know, there's many different forms of something that's either aesthetic or, or written. But um, Stephen Brum writes how the Gothic has always been a barometer of the anxieties that plague a certain culture at a particular moment in history. And I've always loved that about the Gothic. The Gothic, um, as I always say, survives and revives. It's been with us for many, 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 I say many moons. I don't go into my centuries. I'm not going to go the year 1827. I'm going to say many moons ago in ye old days. But it's always been with us and it's always been this place to project and put all our cultural anxieties in. And it's fascinating how it changes. And that's where part of what I research in you know, we've gone past the days of the 1800s and damsel in distress from the oppression of the patriarchal, this and that from, from the Gothic. We've got that fear of prohibition, which was very heavy back then. And we've, because over time we reduced our unwanted, we are reducing marginalization in our culture all the time. 
and the gothic reflects this how are we reducing that and it reflects our fears at the time so it's a very interesting part and that's part of where I'm looking at this in terms of you know where our fears are lying interesting though and I think this <laughs> for me for me it's not interesting probably uh normally but this year last year alone will be interesting to see where the gothic goes in terms of reflecting the current political climate and the current state of fear you know are we going to go back into zombies this has been discussed and if you want to put in the chat i'd have a chat with you afterwards it's just a question that i just went off and thought of are we going to go back to the zombies and the plagues and the pandemic style or are we going to transition our gothic a little bit different So in terms of gothic trauma, this is an interesting statement that I've always found. It says gothic is trauma and trauma is gothic. Always gives you something to think about there um, by saying that, that they both seem to go hand in hand. There's, you know, gothic is, tra it does represent trauma, but trauma itself tends to be gothic. Um, and what Stephen Brum gets at is by saying that we not only want to be haunted, as a contemporary culture, we feel that we need to be haunted. Trauma is playing such a role um, right now in, in films. And um, it's, it really is saying that this Gothic and trauma are together. And as Brum says, I think that contemporary Gothic is the manifestation of the desire for trauma, not the trauma of desire, that finds itself prohibited, but something of a sense that trauma itself is the lost object, that the experience of trauma, not the healing of it, is that which makes us whole. So as I've just said kind of in the last clip, we've got these early Gothic anxieties um, that were fear of this prohibition in, in the time and this fear of fragmentation of ourselves. And yet we've evolved over time to become these modern fears that we fear to be whole. The new normal is to be abnormal, um, as a lot of critics say. That's giving a lot of people food for thought at the moment, um, you know, because we're reducing this marginalization of within our culture and society, because we're accepting so much more and we're working hard on that. One of the offsets then is that it becomes okay to not be normal. I always call that normal. I don't believe in perfect or normal um, as a person. Um, but to look at how it's okay to be just that little bit different. And the saying that contemporary Gothic trauma is something that we're craving, something that we're looking for now so that we can feel that, that safety net of placing those anxieties into it. And just to finish off on the, the gothic trauma thing, yeah, as I was summing up, it, it's this quote that says, we crave it because we need it. We need it because the 20th century, as that this was written um, as of then, has so forcefully taken away from us that which we want to start constituted as a coherent psych, a social order to which we can pledge allegiance in good faith, a sense of justice in the universe. And that wrenching withdrawal, that traumatic experience is vividly dramatized in the Gothic. So just to, to kind of put in the, in the briefest nutshell, I suppose, of, of Gothic trauma is what we go through as a culture, whether it's political, whether it's a social upheaval, um, even from the times of the French Revolution, all the way through to now, especially this year, we're putting all that into the Gothic. So it's interesting to see where it's, where it's going and where it's been. Um, and yeah, I look forward to the future films that are about to come out to see what they're looking at. So we've got the gothic trauma, um, and obviously we've got the trauma um, of what's happened at the, in this film, um, which is an actual trauma of losing your loved ones and trauma of you losing a child. In terms of the landscape, as I said, if it's this projection of the inner psyche that's in there, if what we're seeing is this, this psychological landscape, the landscape that I look at is a little bit different, but hopefully I'll make a little bit of sense to you. And I call it the transitional landscape. So it's this place, this, this grand space, in which when the self has become broken, when the self has lost its 
identity when something has happened to trigger that which is often trauma and in this case it's grief the self becomes so lost that they enter this transitional place a place that's in between where it's somewhere to work out your identity and to grow yourself and to repair so it's an in-between space it's where it's represented as somewhere where fantasy meets reality self meets the other often this will you will see this in film there might be a wooded uh, a wooded forest there's going to be a wooded forest not a metal forest but there's going to be a woodland or forest and you know that perhaps there's some there's a, a creature in there and the person has suffered a trauma they've suffered a death they go into this forest they have to battle against the creature in there it's a very similar trope and the cave system here works the same where we see this person she's lost she's grieving uh, the trauma has, has triggered her own descent into this place and she's trying to battle between herself and other. It's the transitional place where she can hopefully, and she hopes to, repair that. They move really slowly. Let's go faster next time. So um, when I say the word transitional space and transitional um, landscape as well, it's, it's based on Donald Winnicott. Um, object relations um, in other words it's just this psychological space as i've said where fantasy meets reality he developed it from the transitional phenomena phenomena and he developed it as a place where we revisit um, time and time again especially if we've undergone something that's triggered that state and it's somewhere we can kind of work through our identity issues and rebuild ourselves and in this, obviously, Sarah is trying to deal with this grief um, that she feels, and she has entered this, this landscape that we see. So the landscape itself, cave system. It's a brilliant um, Gothic landscape, I think. I mean, you've got the woods, you've got different places, even water. But the caves for me, I think because my, me personally, I am claustrophobic. So if you watch a film that's claustrophobic itself, you do find that it's much more intense. If anybody else has seen um, As Above, So Below in the Paris catacombs, oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's worse than this one in terms of the claustrophobic feel. So this, this landscape of the cave systems is brilliant because it brings this fear of the unknown. You don't know, you can't see um what's ahead of you you don't even know if the cave is going to collapse on you or if you're going to fit through the tunnel i wouldn't fit through any tunnel i mean let's face it you'd need you'd need to be like the size of my son to fit through some of these tunnels so for me when i'm watching them you think would i even fit through there would i be able to just crawl through would i not have a panic attack and just die on the spot i think i would um i'd probably be the one that melts down and cries and just completely falls apart i would never you think i couldn't be this brave and get through these tiny tunnels in caves um so it gives this kind of sense of claustrophobia in the film which is fantastic and this sense of isolation and hopelessness um they don't know where the way out is because it's a cave system they've not been in before there's no map there's no um there's very little light um in there as well so they've, they've been plunged into this this dark place and it as i've said represents this kind of abyss of service psyche. it is her unconscious and so we've got this, this cave system of this kind of spatial disorientation. It's a liminal space that we've crossed into and it, it's there as psych and it's not a very nice place to be um, because she's suffered such trauma. It's a very dark place to be. That's so slow. There we go. So as I've mentioned already, I've, I've touched upon this cultural marginalization so in terms of madness, let me just briefly explain to you what I mean when I say madness in film, because the way that I do madness is it's not, for instance, a film like The Joker or a Split or something where it's just there. It's looking at madness as this embodiment of our culture. And it's so slow. Ugh. I have to get that to, to time faster. We start with Bedlam, I call it Bedlam, Bethlehem Hospital. Um, we are steeped in British history um, when it comes to the treatment of mad. And again, it's madness, normality, 
perfection. They're, these are all words that I do that with because madness uh, means so much more than something that's pathological. So I look at madness as something that is an embodiment of our societal unwantedness, in other words. from Even from the asylum days, we placed our marginalised into these places and labelled them mad. You know, we placed not just people that had pathological mental disturbance, but we placed pretty much anybody that didn't fit into society, that didn't fat, uh, fit as part of this civilization of, of the working economic that we wanted. There were beggars in there. Um, there, were, there were women with perhaps postnatal depression. There were people with epilepsy. There were people with disabilities. There were eccentrics. There were poets, um, writers. We, we, anybody that didn't just quite fit into the time or place that we wanted to be in our civilization became labeled as mad. And that stigma has stayed with us over the centuries. And it became something much more than just a label for mental illness. Mad and madness became something as a symbol for our society's unwanted. What we cast off, we cast off our unwanted and we place it into this symbol of the mad. So when you see descents into madness on screen or in literature, it's not necessarily always just this pathological, perhaps, you know, schizophrenia or psychosis. It's also this embodiment of our anxieties, our unwanted, parts of ourselves and our culture that we cast off and we place into madness. That's why gothic madness plays such a central role in a lot of the stories, because this madness embodies all those fears that we don't want anymore. And it represents the marginalized as it always has. So it means just more, um, in other words, in this film. But in particular of this film, when we move to the more pathological side of madness, Sarah has lost a child. They say there's nothing worse um, than to lose an, your own child. And this trauma has triggered her own madness. It's triggered something, uh, it, which is why we see this hallucinatory um, place and projection where she's trying so desperately to work through her grief. Um, so she's hallucinating this psychological journey. She's trying to work through this trauma. Um, and it's leading to these, these dark places, even from the corridor where she hallucinates the hospital and the cave system, everything is a part of the psych. Um, she's got this form of maternal madness, as they call it, maternal trauma, um, which is slightly different. And if I come back to do any other talks, I'll go to the other side. I can go to the other side of the fence. I do maternal trauma and then I flip it and look at the paternal failure and paternal trauma. I do both. But we won't go into the paternal, paternal right now. We'll look at maternal. And it's often treated differently and represented, represented differently in film is when a maternal loses. You've got some brilliant films out there that have represented this loss. You've got the triangle and um, you've got resurrection um, where they're trying to bring the children back, you know, the other side of the door, a dark song. You can see a lot of pain in terms of the maternal loss and you see a lot of madness because of that and the trigger. So there's some really good films out there for, for that side of things. Um, well, they're not, they hard to watch some of them in places, especially if you are a parent. I will just put a disclaimer there. You know, if you've got children, be aware if you're watching films about the loss of a child, they're not always the most fun thing to watch. Friends and Monsters, I have to mention them because they are parts of the film, the parts of Sarah Spike. So just a brief mention, because um, it's not just a solitary journey that we see her on. She's in the caves with others. She's taken her friends with her and that she's come across these crawlers as well. So her friends, I think it's her friends up first. She's There's a lot of blame here and anger. What's happened with Sarah is, um, which happens commonly with um, kind of a, a pathological grief, mourning and trauma, is there's got to be some blame somewhere. You blame yourself. There's guilt. She feels guilt. Um, she, you know, you have yourself blame, but she has other blame that she is now projecting onto other parts. And these 
delusion was that she's seeing of her friends in that cave are part an kind of like an allegory of her own feelings. Um, so just to mention, we've got Beth. I know if you haven't seen the film or you haven't seen it for a while, so you might not remember the names. So that's even more reason that you have to watch it tonight, you see. So we've got Beth. Um, Beth was a friend who was also aware of this relationship between her husband and Juno. Uh, so there's angry feelings towards Beth. Uh, Sam, uh, she relied on to be there for the funeral. She couldn't make it for the funeral. Again, when you are grieving, you place your anger into different places as well. It kind of comes out in all different angles when you're going through that. Um, we've got Holly, who um, there's an awkward moment before they enter the cave um, in the cabin where Holly mentions children um, at the dinner before the expedition. And there's that awkwardness, as in, is Sarah quite ready to, to discuss talking even about children? Is she okay to even look at another child at the moment? Is she still very traumatised? And then, of course, Juno, the other, I suppose, heroine in the film, um, the ultimate betrayal, she had an affair with her husband. Um, <laughs> you can't get much worse a betrayal than that in terms of friendships. So there's a lot of anger there, and that's why Juno probably makes it to the very end. Spoiler alert, everybody. Um, I'm going on to the spoiler alert with the ending in a minute. But... Um, Juno makes it to the end because she saves that for last because she's the most angry at that. Um, she's not only had that betrayal, but she feels that Juno should have been there more through her grieving process. But Juno herself has been grieving. So there's that kind of parallel. Her best friend has been grieving for the loss because she had the affair and she lost somebody too. So let's move on to the crawlers, as they are called. When I was doing this, this is just a, a kind of Mel thought. I was doing this and they, as I've mentioned, these, these human-like primeval creatures, and they do represent this part of Sarah's other. They are the monsters in the wood. They are the, the creatures in the cave. They are this split part of her other. They are part of herself that she has put all that bad into and she must face. But they reminded me, and this is just one I like a little Mel thought of um, H.G. Wells. And I got my book out of the time machine and because of the way that they looked and I thought, oh, the white and the fact that they're blind and can only hear and the way that they look. And I came across this passage that says where he's, he's kind of describing the creatures in the time machine. Uh, bleached, obscene, nocturnal things spectrally hiding in the dark gutters of a vast arched cavern which stretched into utter darkness beyond the range of light. And it just reminded me of that. You know, we've got this cave, there's no light, it's dark, uh, the nocturnal, obscene, bleached creatures in the time machine. And it just added that element. And yeah, I've wanted to reread all my HD Wells now. It's a very similar kind of creature that's hiding this primeval, creature very similar to that <laughs> so yeah as I mentioned they are this split part of Sarah and I will then just move towards the split bear with me on this so we've entered this landscape it's a transitional space she's going through this form of trauma that's triggered this descent into madness so the whole thing is this journey of herself she needs to repair herself she needs to mourn the loss she needs to deal with the guilt and anger and everything else that she's feeling and the form of herself meeting the other in these landscapes herself meeting the crawlers the friends representing parts of the site that she's angry at and we've then got um oh, so slow. i'm gonna speed it up by tonight Melanie Klein, um, again, object relations, who describes how at certain points in life, not just childhood, but there are certain reasons that we will return to what's called the paranoid schizoid state. Um, in other words, a place where we split good, bad. Now in between, there's just good and bad. This comes through in a lot in films, especially like um, you'll get like younger adventure films, you know, good versus evil. Um, there's no in between. It has to be the good guy beats the bad guy. And then in the end, you realize that the bad guy isn't that bad. 
Um, so we've got this good versus bad. And often it's because we're trying to interject with all the good and all that bad, horrid, poisonous blame that we feel and fear of persecution for ourselves, we push out onto another. And that is the monstrous, um, often in horror or gothic, it will be the monster. Sometimes it's the cell. You know, when you get a double in there, push it onto our cell. Um, but it, it still represents us. It's this part of ourselves that we don't want um, because it's something bad and we're using it as a defense against that fear of losing ourselves. So we try to survive. So this good, bad state, you do work through. And once you work through and you journey through this kind of space, this transitional space psychologically, in here, it's the cave system. As you journey through and you start to deal with yourself and other and you battle all the parts of you that you've cast off and you feel are bad, you start to integrate. And what that means is you move on to, in, in real life, you will move on to a depressive positioning. And that's when the person will realize that there's no such thing as just bad or just good. It's, it's one of the whole person. It's a whole together. Um, and that you did split it just to defend yourself. And then you feel bad. So that's why it's called this depressive positioning. You feel guilt that you actually made some other object, whether it's, um, you know, a person or an actual object, whether you made it bad <laughs> because you, you put all that badness onto it. So you want to repair that. In other words, you want to say sorry. Um, you feel sorry. And that's part of maturing to realize that there is no such thing as just good, just bad. Everybody's a bit of both and you want to repair that. And that's a normal process in, in our cycle of life. And we can be jolted back to this paranoid state if there's something that's done that. There may be a trigger. Um, often it's trauma. There can be grief. Um, there can be incidents. It could be something as simple as you could get into a car accident and something jolts you back where suddenly you feel like you've got to defend yourself. You feel a bit broken inside. So you can go through these loops all the time, but you eventually go through and you feel better and then back and forth. That's the normal process. However, unfortunately, and rather gothically in this, Sarah doesn't. There's this Sisyphean struggle. If you don't, I don't, oh, Sisyphean, Sisyphean. Um, brilliant um, kind of like tale, uh, you know, if, I'm sure you all know about the struggle to constantly push uphill and, and never end. There's this groundhog I always say Groundhog Day, everybody knows what I mean by this, that then. Um, there's this never ending cycle um, that can happen in certain moments of extreme upset or extreme trauma. If you really have lost, truly lost yourself and Sarah doesn't manage to get through. Um, she doesn't manage to work out and work through this, unfortunately. Like I said, it's very gothic here. There's no happy, happy endings here um she doesn't repair everything she doesn't defeat all the crawlers sorry spoiler alert spoiler alert. <laughs> i'll come to the end spoiler alert she doesn't defeat them all um in her own hallucinatory kind of nightmare so there's no reparation she's condemned to keep going back and forth and and be in this state of splitting so the british version I mentioned the british version um, because the British version ends with the birthday cake, which is where we began. It ends where she hallucinates that she gets out. You see this great scene where she gets out and you're like, oh, thank God she, she got out. But she doesn't. It's an hallucination. She's still back in the cave uh, with this torch. And she's seeing her girl again with the birthday cake, the exact same one that we see at the beginning. And she's smiling as you say, I'm still, I'm still seeing my daughter. I'm still not okay. She, she hasn't managed to repair that trauma yet. So she's got this, this torch and she's seeing this birthday cake. And that's where the loop and the Sisyphean struggle comes in for this maternal trauma because the next part could very easily be that we're back around to the beginning. The birthday cake, she wakes in the hospital, hallucinates, descends back again. And then it ends again with birthday cake. And then we're back again. 
And it's that same roof, that paranoid schizoid roof, that same struggle of trying to repair yourself, but stuck in it. That happens in quite a few films where we've got this schizophrenia loop. Um, you get it in other terms where it's more comedy. You know, um, you even get comedy horror like uh, Happy Death Day. You know, you've got that that loop that just never wants to end. And that can be in terms of a, a quite a dark gothic trauma where her pain is not ready to end yet. So until she's ready to really let go of that grief, she's going to keep looping around in possibly the same and hallucination until hopefully I mean we can still be hopeful surely that she will she will work through it and she will escape and stay out there and she maybe will wake in the hospital truly and she will move on with her life um but the way that the film ends is that she's going to go back again and again until she works through it um so yeah that's the end I've ended really gloomily I've made you all gloomy for from Sunday morning, <laughs> scare you all and make you all feel really, really sad. Um, that's what I tend to do best. Um, but yeah, that's that, as they say, is is that. <laughs>